Hey there, I'm Philip Molina, and this is a breakdown of the season finale of Game of Thrones. It's season six, episode 10, The Winds of Winter. And now while we did predict some of the things that were gonna happen in this episode, that didn't make them any less shocking. And honestly, for me, the biggest surprise of all was just how good this episode was, considering how amazing the last episode was. It's really rare to get two in a row like this. And as of right now, both of these episodes have a perfect 10 on IMDb. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they were both directed by the amazing Miguel Miguel Sapochnik. All right, so sit back and relax because we've got a lot of analysis and missable details to talk about. This was the longest episodes of Game of Thrones ever, and with good reason, so much happens. But seriously, that means that this is going to be huge. So let's just go ahead and get started with the opening images. Actually though, ahead of the images, let's quickly address what we hear over these images. It's the sound of the huge bell that hangs over the Great Sept, ringing for, as it turns out, the very last time. Now this bell has always been paired with some bad times for our characters, and having marked the death of various Lannisters, it's definitely a sound that has haunted Cersei. We'll come back to the bell later, but let's talk about what we're seeing here. Following up the epic scale of the Battle of the Bastards, the director chose to actually scale things way, way down to a very small personal level, paying meticulous detail to the simplicity of each of them getting ready. He does this to really underline each of these characters as individual people. Note how at this point, we don't even see the faces of their helpers. They're all effectively alone right now. And that is gonna make it hit that much harder when we see what becomes of each of these people later in the episode. We're not just gonna see a big group of deaths, we're gonna feel each one as a single loss. Now this move, this focusing on the minutia of preparations in a show as epic as Game of Thrones, it's actually becoming a director trademark for this guy. This director's directed four episodes of this show and they often open this way, just really scaled down. This season he directed Battle of the Bastards and this episode The Winds of Winter and he starts with that focus on the small mechanics of what's about to happen. And then last season he directed Hard Home and The Gift. And you can see how The Gift also opens with the simplicities of preparation. And actually now is a good time to explain a really special relationship between these two episodes. So last season's Hard Home is a pretty obvious sister episode to this season's Battle of the Bastards. They're both about Jon Snow and his men being completely devastated in battle against their former allies turned enemies. But actually the other pair of episodes, this season finale and last season's The Gift, they're also very much sister episodes too. In fact, they're more linked than probably any pair of episodes the show's ever had. So this episode's all about how we're finally seeing the changing of the seasons. And with that, we get all the setups and promises finally being paid off. So if this episode is about the fulfillment of those promises, the gift is the episode that set up those ideas. We'll get into the links of these two sister episodes more as we go, but let's just call it right now, this Sapochnik guy's director, he's a genius. Okay, now before we move on completely from the opening images, let's quickly point out a few things here. First, it's important to realize that everyone is getting ready for most of the sequence, but when you look at Cersei, she's already dressed. That's pointing out to us that while each of these people is just beginning to plan for their day, Cersei's plans have already long been in motion, and now she's waiting for everyone to catch up to her. And this outfit is clearly a feminine power outfit that's inspired by the powerful leather attire that was once worn by Tywin Lannister. Just just like how Jamie recently stepped into the Tywin role but kind of hated it, Cersei is trying on the role of head of House Lannister, but she actually loves it. Then, once everyone is in place, Cersei finally chooses to don one more layer, armor. She's not going to trial, she's going to war. This is a nice callback actually to the first season when Cersei suggests she'd make a better ruler than Robert. I should wear the armor. And you the gown. And as we prepare to transition to the trial itself, I'll point out how this version of trial with seven high septons is something that hasn't been done in hundreds of years. And while it feels like we just learned about it a few episodes ago, this actually was first set up in The Gift. A trial will be held for each of them to determine if they're guilty of any act that might constitute a violation of the tenets of the faith. Who's Dan Judge? Seven septons. But it's not just being set up in that scene. The High Sparrow actually foreshadows what's gonna happen to every person there and to the Great Sept of Baelor itself. Listen closely. Baelor built his sept around it. With that great gilded monstrosity up there. Strip away the gold and the ornaments. Knock down the statues and the pillars. Tyrell's finery will be stripped away. Their lies knocked down. Their true hearts laid bare for all to see. And so it will be for all of us. 
Well, yeah, all of those things are definitely stripped away, himself included, but it's funny because as it's happening, he's totally blind to the event itself until it's too late. Remember how a few episodes back, a shot of a sewer grate was used to remind us about these tunnels beneath the city and what Cersei could do with them? Well, our first shot inside the grate set concludes that setup by aiming down directly over the sewer grate that leads below the set. And the High Sparrow being totally clueless to that danger that's beneath him, it's emphasized again and again in these later shots where he keeps being seen from below, but he's only concerned what is up above him, the gods. He's paying attention to the wrong direction. And this being unaware of the danger that awaits, it's not just the cinematography communicating this. This amazing, amazing score. plays a big role in telling the story too. Now, before we dive into how it does that, I wanna point out something interesting here. This is the first time we've heard piano as the lead instrument in Game of Thrones, which normally uses strings and percussion. Piano happens to be a fairly modern instrument invented somewhere around 1700. Meanwhile, we're used to a score that matches the Middle Ages, which is the time that we usually equate with the show. So this choice to use piano is another one of these markers in this episode that signifies a modernization, changing of the seasons, out with the old and with the new. And again, that's a major theme of this episode. But okay, I wanna dive into just how masterful this piece of music was, but because I know I'm about to nerd out about music theory and that might not be up all of your alleys, uh, here's the time to skip to if you don't care about the role music plays in storytelling. Cool? All right, great. Okay, so first off, I wanna point out that music was creating unease before the episode even started. I don't know if you all noticed, but the previously on Game of Thrones section was very different than usual. It started with music rather than dialogue and just as it finishes right before we're launched into the episode the composer chose to strike a discordant note this starts us off balance right away. Kind of like climbing an old staircase and you catch your foot on the very last step. It starts you off uneasy. Then as the music plays over the sequence, it actually tells the story as it unfolds by adding musical layering. Each moment characters come closer to danger and ultimately their deaths. Watch, check it out. The moment we're shown the set, the score kicks in, but with extreme restraint, just an incredibly simple piano melody. Everyone walks in clueless. And then as the intended victims, the Tyrells, the High Sparrow, they begin to take their place a layer of strings comes in, signifying that they're a layer closer to danger. But then we switch to Pycelle, who has not at all stepped into danger yet, and thus the music pulls back again, removing a layer, and it's just a simple piano again. Tommen also has no understanding of what's happening yet, and so we stay in that simple piano. Then, Lancel and Pycelle alternate, but still don't know anything yet, and so everything remains in piano. That is until the very moment that Pycelle sees Kyburn. Now he's thrown out of rhythm, and so is the music. Right then, it strikes an awkward pair of notes for this awkward encounter so it's clear something is up. Now as Lancel and Pycelle grow one layer closer to their deaths, a musical layer is added, the singing of two boys, representing the little birds who will cause the deaths of these two characters. When Pycelle becomes aware, getting his final sign, seeing the knife before him, the final warning layer of strings is added. And then, right when death has arrived, a new instrument, often associated with death, a layer of pipe organ, is added. But then we cut back to Lancel and we lose a lot of the layers because he's not as far along in his danger yet. That is until... <coughs> the stab that leads to his death triggers the layers coming back in, including that death pipe organ layer. And here it's much more obvious than before, that organ is playing the main Game of Thrones theme song, reminding us that this is what happens to characters that get mixed up in the great game. And yet again, just as we return to the set, the layers are pulled back again. We're back to simple piano because everyone here is clueless of the impending danger. It's here that I'm gonna point out that the other reason piano was used, because when you strike a piano key, it's really unique in how it has a very powerful attack, striking quickly and sharply, but then it resonates with a long decay, and this is subconsciously similar to the attack and decay of a warning alarm. So moments later, Marjorie starts to put it all together, so cue the layer of warning strings. 
when she encounters the High Sparrow, who's still totally clueless, the strings pull back again. But as she makes her case, they start to swell back in again. And from this point on, everybody's been warned, so the strings do not leave again. And then when Lancel finally sees the wildfire time bomb, he gets it, and our death organ kicks in. He's looking death in the face, and as we alternate between Lancel and the shots inside the set, the organ alternates with it, louder and quieter, louder and quieter. <laughs> Then as everyone in the set realizes fully, not only does the organ come back in full force, but a new and final layer of strings are added. Get us through! And like how the striking of the piano keys were reminiscent to the chimes of a warning siren, these final strings are meant to be the old world equivalent of the beeping of a time bomb. They count down the very last seconds, adding that last bit of intense tension until the very last second and... The music cuts out. They give over the entirety of the full sound spectrum to the explosion, letting us experience it as close to the real thing as possible. So that's that. A brilliantly composed piece of music, unlike anything we've heard on this show, but perfectly matched to the events that were unfolding. It's cool. All right, let's go ahead and move on and rejoin the people who skipped ahead because they hate music. Now, before we leave these moments leading up to the big freaking explosion, I've got to point out a few more things here. Uh, first, Kyburn hits one of our themes about seasons changing right on the head as he says, But sometimes before we can usher in the new, the old must be put to rest. So just as in when the fall season is ending, winter begins, that same winter lays waste to all the old growth that came before. His words are also reflected visually by what happens. The new children put the old man to rest. Also, quick book spoiler here. It's it's really quick actually, so you can just cover your ears if you don't want to know. Uh, but in the books, none of this blowing up the Sep stuff has happened yet. But the last thing we see in the last published book is actually this murder by the little birds. But it's not Pycelle they're killing. It's Kevin Lannister. And the person behind it, strangely enough, it's not Kyburn. It's Varys. Okay, book spoilers over. You can you can come back. Oh, and I have to say, I loved the use of candles as like an ancient time bomb. I got a message on my Facebook page from Roselio Mendoza, and it really clicked with me about these candles. They're a nice representation of the opening sequence itself, but also of this entire season, with the show methodically getting ready at the beginning, and all the episodes leading up to the Battle of the Bastards, you could have kind of described all this as a slow burn. Little did we know what kind of explosive moments were in store for us once the season-long candle reached its end. Two episodes of just full out spectacular chaos. Oh, also unrelated, I have to say, this little kid here is the one that lit those candles. He's got tremendous balls, like elephant balls. Moving on, <laughs> there's also this great but quickly missable moment in the set. When Marjorie shouts at the High Sparrow, the truth finally comes out. Forget about the bloody gods and listen to what I'm telling you. It was all an act. A religious zealot would either listen to the Sparrow or be eager to die for her faith like Unella and the Sparrow claim to be. Instead, she's like, yeah, F this faith thing. Let's get out of here. And that is why the High Sparrow looks so shocked. He had totally fallen for her act. And poor Marjorie, she deserves a special shout out because she did piece this whole thing together before anyone else, and her ability to do that actually was also set up nicely in The Gift. There, Marjorie reveals that she's really good at piecing together when Cersei is up to something. I know you did this. She just wasn't fast enough here. And in that very same scene from The Gift, it has a bit of foreshadowing of what will become of Cersei. As we know now, she's done what the Mad King had always planned to do. And so it's fair to say that this episode, she's officially become the Mad Queen. And if you remember at the beginning of this season, Cersei feels as if she's a prisoner being kept in a cell in the Red Keep. He would like you to remain in the Red Keep, Your Grace. Dear. You have been confined to the Red Keep. Well, back in the scene from The Gift, check out what words she uses to describe what happens to someone when they're kept in a cell in the Red Keep. I've been told men often go mad in the black cells beneath the Red Keep. She was right. It drove her mad. Oh, and again, in terms of this episode, moments after Cersei says that line is when she discovers that Lancel had betrayed her and confessed what they did together, resulting in Cersei being in prison in the first place. So that setup, him metaphorically stabbing her in the back, is paid off in this episode with her planning to have him stabbed in the back. 
All right, so that's everything leading up to the explosion. And if you feel like that was a lot, I'm gonna point out, it may not have felt like it, but the explosion was around 20 minutes into the episode, even though it feels like it happened right at the beginning. But after the explosion, we get Cersei taking in the site with her hair blowing back from the shockwave and winds, making the blast feel on level with like a freaking nuke. And there's the bell that I said I was gonna come back to, which has now been defeated by Cersei as well. It can't ever deliver bad news to her again. Of course, that doesn't stop bad stuff from happening, as we see in a second with Tom. And, and it's kind of sad actually that that's a king dying and the bell's not ever gonna ring for him. But we'll get back to Tommen in a second. Uh, it's Cersei's happiness here that we really need to focus on. We've talked before about how Game of Thrones is inspired by our real history and we've also talked about how King's Landing is the Westerosi version of ancient Rome. This moment with Cersei, it parallels the famous story of Nero watching on as Rome burned. I know a lot of you might have heard that he was playing a fiddle but he probably wasn't because the fiddle wasn't invented yet. But there actually are a lot of stories of people saying exactly what he did do. A number of accounts at least claim that he just watched from a safe distance. Some say he was up in a tower watching, just like Cersei. And some people even think that he deliberately wanted that part of the city destroyed, just like she did, because he later went on to build his golden palace and his pleasure gardens there. But if we stick with how Nero played things, we can also make one possible prediction for season seven. While it's really obvious that Cersei caused this explosion, I wouldn't be surprised if the official stance will be that this was some sort of attack on the faith by some radical sect of another religion. And I say that not only because it kind of makes sense as an excuse, but because that's the same excuse Nero came up with. Not that people believed him either, but in his day, he claimed that the fire must have been caused by crazy followers of that radical new religion known as Christianity. And I've said this before, but the Westerosi equivalent of Christians, they're the followers of the Lord of Light. So maybe Cersei will blame the attack on the Faith of the Seven as having been a strategic move by the Lord of Light followers. But here's the thing, the Faith of the Seven is about to hit a major roadblock. Not only was it completely wiped out at King's Landing, but remember that there were seven High Septons there, meaning that other than the High Sparrow, six other major leaders of that religion have also now been taken out. So if the Lord of Light religion did want to make their move, even though they technically had nothing to do with this attack, now would be a good time. Of course, that wouldn't be that good for Cersei either, considering the two people that the high ups of that religion are worshiping at this moment aren't exactly her biggest fans. And I think we can all agree that in the long term, this grand scheme of Cersei's is only gonna provide her maybe a little win for now and is actually gonna result in her building more enemies. But for now, her most immediate challengers are gone and she is in power and it's all of those circumstances that make this entire thing a big old reference to the godfather in that movie during another very religiously significant moment a baptism in a church michael corleone has his men secretly execute all of his family's challengers simultaneously and their deaths are also indicated by an intense organ score <laughs> And like I said, I think Cersei will absolutely pay for this. Uh, a little later, we're gonna talk about how the gods react to things like this, but I'll point out here that I think the High Sparrow is foreshadowing something that will actually probably happen with this line. The warrior punishes those who believe themselves beyond the reach of justice. The warrior is gonna come for Cersei, but who's that warrior gonna be? Danny, maybe? Or Jamie? But okay, now let's go ahead and talk about poor, poor Tom and Baratheon. Rest in peace uh, on Kids Day, no less. But we're actually gonna use this really cool visual segue the show used to transition to this. We start out with Cersei's view of the destruction and this really slick reference to the line that keeps getting thrown in her face about how the crown and the faith are the twin pillars upon which the world rests. And there are twin pillars. And that shot of the representation of the faith demolished, it cuts to the representation of the crown, Tommen also falling apart. But here's what's really interesting. The editing made us think that this was also Tommen's perspective on the scene. But as we see momentarily, it's not. This is Tommen's view, and this shot here is actually very different. The director stays in this shot to make this moment that happens more surprising, sure, but also it shows us exactly how Tommen sees what just happened. His perspective compared to Cersei's is much more blocked off. Looking at this site, being locked into this view, it makes the audience and Tommen see clearly that there's only one way out, through the window. And this fall is a payoff of the setup from the pilot where Tommen's real father, Jamie, forced this kind of fall onto Bran. It kicked off the whole story, but now it comes back to their family, but way worse. 
Man, the things that this family does for love, by the way. Now, it also, though, is paying off a setup from the episode The Gift. It's a couple of moments, actually. So, in our current episode, Tommen sees that he's lost his queen and lost his faith all in the same moment, and seeing no alternatives, he goes out the window. In The Gift, Tommen is upset that THE QUEEN IS IN PRISON AND THERE IS NOTHING I CAN DO! Seeing no alternatives, he gets lost, gazing out a window. It's Cersei that has to pull him back from it. And there, while she tries to console him, she gives us that foreshadowing line about what she did this episode. I would do anything for you. Anything to keep you from harm. I would burn cities to the ground. Except in this episode, while she does burn a city to the ground, it's for her own selfish reason, not to keep him from harm. In fact, she's not there to keep him from harm when he goes to the window this time. And that episode reiterates this point multiple times when Cersei tells Elena that- I'll never leave my son. And when she tells Marjorie that she must go. I'm afraid I must. My son needs me now more than ever. Yet when he really needs her most, and Marjorie isn't just in a cell, she's dead, instead of going to be by his side to comfort him, she instead heads off to gleefully torture Septonella. And since we are talking about both episodes right now, let's go ahead and point out another completion of a setup. Since The Gift is the episode where Cersei is first taken by Onella and makes that threat that she references this episode. Look at my face. It's the last thing you'll see before you die. <laughs> Here's what's really cool, actually. When she leaves Anella behind screaming, it's even shot exactly the same way with the doorway and its window showing us the inside one last time before it's closed off. Now there is probably a lot more to say about this creepy and pretty evil Unella scene here, but we've got so much more to cover and I, I think we should just move on. You can hit me up separately if you want to discuss it further. For now, let's just move on to the Red Wedding Part 2, Honeymoon Pie. And it's really interesting to rewatch these scenes knowing that Arya is there the whole time. She stares at Jaime for a bit, which they read as flirting, but knowing it's Arya, it feels more sinister. She probably is actually considering whether or not she should kill him, but she chooses to spare him since he's not really on her list. That said, he probably would be on her list if she knew he was the one that pushed Bran out that window. Fun little thing to point out, by the way, when Walder Frey asks, The Starks mock me. Where are they now? There's one right there. That's Arya passing by in the background unbeknownst to him. By the way, it's pretty clever how Arya chose to make her way into this place. She's purposely using a skill that she's had a lot of practice with, serving as a cupbearer to a prominent lord. Remember her in Tywin? And she was hiding her identity that time too. The only thing about that though is that she doesn't entirely remember all of the training she got there or she purposely wanted Walder to know that something was up because check out this warning that Tywin gives her about the way she addresses him. Go. My lord. No born girls say my lord, not my lord. If you're going to pose as a commoner, you should do it properly. And yet, here she makes the same mistake again. You're not one of mine, are you? No, my lord. My lord. My lord. But again, it could be on purpose. And then we have the pie. And this is a twist from a similar event in the books where the Mandalays actually make the pie and they feed it to the Boltons. And honestly, I like this version better. Making it Arya who does this gives a real nice justification of where she got this idea from. Because she learned it from old Nan and the tales that she used to tell the Stark children. And we know that because Bran, who often recounts old Nan's tales, tells us about this tale of the rat cook a few seasons ago. And this is actually the same night as the Red Wedding. The cook killed the king's son cooked him into a big pie. That night, he served the pie to the king. He liked the taste of his son so much, he asked for a second slice. The gods turned the cook into a giant white rat who could only eat his own young. He's been roaming the night fort ever since. A moment later, Bran also explains how that story has to do with the punishment for violating guests' rights. It rat. wasn't for murder the gods cursed the rat cook or for serving the king's son in a pie. He killed a guest beneath his roof. That's something the gods can't forgive. So this moment now is finally payback for this huge violation of guest rights that Walder Frey made back in the Red Wedding. But here's a thought, something I touched on earlier actually. If the gods take a violation of guest rights this seriously, and this is the level of punishment they deliver, what do the gods think uh, when you destroy their main house of worship and kill all the people inside? I mean, since Bran is referring to the old gods and the Sept of Baelor is about the new gods, I think Cersei just better hope that the Seven are a lot more chill than the old gods are. And just two final points to make here about this story at the twins. First, we hear what are probably the words of House Frey at the beginning. It's not for 
sure that those are words, but it definitely seems like it. And that's actually a big deal because that's the first time we've ever heard them, ever, including in the books. So now we know that House Frey is all about standing together and loyalty. Sure, House Frey, you believe whatever you want. Uh, the other thing to point out is that with Walder Frey's throat being slashed, all the main perpetrators of the events of the Red Wedding, Walder Frey, Roos Bolton, and Tywin Lannister, they've now been killed in the same way that the Starks were killed at the Red Wedding. Stabbed in the gut, shot with a crossbow, and having their throat slit. Karma can be so tidy. Okay, let's move on to Cersei checking out Tommen's body. Her grace, there's no need. Show me. I only want to point out two things here, actually. First, Cersei wanting to see Tommen's body after it's fallen from however high up. It's actually a little bit of a callback to her as a child wanting to know what her mother's corpse looks like after she's died. Do you remember the first time you saw a dead body? Mother. All I could think about when she died was what would happen to her now. Every day, every night. What does Mama look like now? And also wondering the same of Marcella. I think about locking Marcella in a crypt. I think about her beautiful little face starting to close. She's kind of into corpses. And second, Cersei mentions that Tommen should be laid to rest where his brother, sister, and grandfather are. He should be with his grandfather, his brother, his sister. Burn him. Bury his ashes where the sept once stood. That means that the remains of her children and her father were also at the Sept of Baelor, and yet that did not stop her from blowing it up. It further cements that Cersei has no patience for death. She doesn't care about what happens after. She's even denying Tom in a funeral here. It explains why she acts the way she does. She probably doesn't even believe in any of the gods, and she feels that her only chance at happiness and success is here in this life now. She doesn't care about any sort of punishment in the afterlife. It makes her way more dangerous because she truly has nothing to fear now. Okay, and now we are off to Old Town, and we start this with a really pretty shot where we see all these white ravens flying out the Citadel Tower. These white ravens are only sent out when a new season has officially been declared, so this is a visual representation of that episode-long theme of promises delivered and seasons changing. Ironically, we see one of these go to Winterfell, as if they didn't already know that winter has come. And then when Sam meets this sassy Citadel receptionist, uh, Karen McLean on my Facebook page pointed out that it's very possibly a reference to this scene in the movie Brazil. She's probably right because we've got another character here named Sam who just so happens to be played by the High Sparrow himself, Jonathan Price, and he's entering into this very similar, very big hall with another tight-lipped receptionist and endless records await him there too. And that movie also has some fun, weird magnifying glasses. And now when we gain access to the internal Citadel library, this is all pretty beautiful. And while a lot of you probably caught this one, I gotta point out how cool it is to finally see what looks to be maybe the exact same astrolabe from the opening. Even the inscriptions look the same. And I want to go into theory time to discuss what exactly this might be telling us. And actually, you know what? It's the end of the season and this is a pretty weird but fun idea. So what the hell? Let's make it another instance of really out there theory time. Okay, welcome to Really Out There Theory Time. Uh, so this astrolabe that is from the opening credits and we now see where it really lives, I think that just put this entire series into context for us. The events of Game of Thrones, the TV show at least, from the royals visiting Winterfell in the pilot to however this whole thing is going to end, are either all in the process of being recorded as part of the official written record of the history of Westeros by a maester in the Citadel, maybe even Sam himself, or they're being studied by a future student in the Citadel who is reading along as we watch it. And here's why I think this. The opening credits show the Citadel astrolabe hanging high up over this map. The map itself is constantly being updated and changed, both in terms of what places we need to focus on, but also even who holds that location, like the Boltons or the Starks, or also what season we're even in. With winter, a lot of the map became frozen over recently. So let's say it's Sam doing this, and he's writing this story down, and consistently he's redrawing out the map as part of his records. And maybe this map is actually a very small drawing, like on the corner of a page. And in order to edit it, he needs to wear magnifying lenses like the ones the other maester was wearing, and like the lenses that magnify the map in the opening credits. Cool, right? So maybe Sam is the guy that's writing this entire story, like the, the Song of Ice and Fire itself. And that would make him a representation of George R. R. Martin himself. It definitely would explain how Sam goes to bravely kill a White Walker and then totally gets laid. 
<laughs> but all right, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump out of really out there theory time. The only two other things to point out about this visit here. First, that astrolabe thing has one more really cool property. It seems like all these chains can be pulled to reflect sunlight to the various dark points of the library, which is smart because too many candles in that place could easily cause the green trial part two. But the other thing I want to point out here is why Sam is even here. I mean, we technically know this already, but it's worth reminding us. He's on a mission to learn whatever he can to help defeat the White Walker army. And while it's not the most exciting story right now, it could become invaluable later. And a lot of long lost secrets are locked away in this place. So Sam could learn how to create more dragon glass, which kills White Walkers, or he does have Heartsbane with him. Maybe he's gonna learn from these books how to create Valyrian steel, which is a long lost art form. And it also makes White Walkers not feel too good. <laughs> And finally, uh, this one's a little bit out there, but a lot of maesters try to learn one more thing here. It's magic. And a lot of them fail to learn it. But what if Sam could learn the ways of magic, like those warlocks of Karth or Kyburn? That'd be pretty cool. You're a wizard, Sam. I always wanted to be a wizard. Okay, so that's it for Old Town. And before we move on, now's a good time to just say thank you to everyone who has signed up to help us out on Patreon. I am forever grateful for your support. And as more of you keep signing up and helping us blast through our goals like you have been already, I'm getting more and more excited for what this channel is gonna become. We're gonna keep scaling up and not only are our videos gonna come out faster as we can afford to hire full-time editors and, and finally pay Kylo actually, but we're also gonna be able to do way more videos about way more topics. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, just go ahead, it's patreon.com slash new rock stars. Look at the goals and the rewards that you would get. But in general, yes, thank you so much. We sincerely appreciate it, thank you. But also I need to go to the bathroom really bad. So stay right there. I've been holding it this whole breakdown, uh, but I promise I will be right back. I promise I'll pay it off later. We'll jump into Winterfell, be right back. And we're back, promises fulfilled. <laughs> and we are in Winterfell with the showdown between Davos and Melisandre that we've been waiting for all season. And I've gotta admit, I'm a little surprised that Davos let Melly leave this place alive. Her burning Shireen is probably one of the most disgusting things we've ever seen any character on this show do, which is saying a lot. By the way, the idea to burn Shireen, so the setup for this moment that we're seeing now, it's also from the gift. I have shown you the power of King's blood. We don't have Robert's bastard here. No, we have someone better and your blood runs through her veins. But anyway, other things to point out here. First, I think there's a little bit more meaning to this charred stag than it just being the evidence for Davos to catch up to what's happened. With the stag being the sigil for House Baratheon, seeing this burnt little figurine, it actually symbolizes what's happened this episode. Technically speaking, with Tommen's death today, the Baratheon line has been totally wiped out. It's burned and done. So that's pretty huge, actually. And we'll get into the idea of who the throne is technically supposed to go to later Later, but I'll just point out that if you follow the Baratheon line upward from Tommen, it goes to his older male sibling, who's dead, then their father, who is dead, then to his father's male siblings, who are also dead. Then you start going to grandparents, and that's where things get interesting. But we'll talk about that when we get to the Iron Throne later. Also, I just want to point out this debate that Davos and Melisandre have, it's actually pretty fascinating. They're both totally right. Like, I agree with Davos that any god that wants you to burn a little girl alive is probably a bad god. You burnt a little girl alive. I only do what my lord commands. If he commands you to burn children, your lord is evil. But Melisandre's totally right too when she points out that the Lord of Light brought John back. That's the only reason they're even standing there. We are standing here because of him. Jon Snow is alive because the Lord willed it. So if you're happy that John's back, you can't totally hate that Lord. I genuinely don't know where I stand on the Lord of Light right now. Uh, tell me what you guys think in the comments, but let's keep going. Oh, and onto this conversation outside with John and Sansa. So this again hits us right in the face with these themes. This moment actually connects our two main ones. Promises are being fulfilled and seasons are changing. The long awaiting promise of the season of winter coming, it's now being fulfilled. Winter is here. The winds of winter are basically hitting us smack in the face right now. I joked earlier that this is probably the one place that maybe didn't need a raven because they all know that winter is here and they've known that since the day that the snow came and never stopped coming. By the way, that day was depicted in the other episode of The Gift. Winter is coming. Those aren't just the stark words. That's a fact. I want to point out something here about the roles that Sansa and Jon are playing right now. It's pretty clear that Jon is very much a Ned Stark surrogate. He does what is right and honorable, even if it's gonna hurt him. For the watch. 
Sansa is a little bit more cunning, and she suggests that only a fool would trust Littlefinger. Well, she doesn't mean for that to be an insult to him, but Ned Stark made that same mistake. I did warn you not to trust me. And is maybe the biggest example of someone falling for a Littlefinger trap. So since John is filling that Ned role now, it makes me wonder, is he going to make the same mistake? He hasn't been great about heeding Sansa's advice, so is he going to walk right into a Littlefinger trap himself? Oh, and just before we move on, I wonder where Melisandre's heading. We know she has to write south, and we also know that the Brotherhood without banners, they're writing north, so could they intercept each other? The main reason why that might be interesting is because of Arya, actually. Uh, way back when, the Red Woman said this to her. We will meet again. And in that scene, Arya is very pissed that Thoros and Beric Dondarrion just sold her buddy Gendry to Melisandre. She's so pissed that she actually puts all three of them on her list. The Red Woman. Beric Dondarrion, the Ross of Mir. So if they all happen to go to the same place and meet up, and with Arya now back in Westeros, crossing names off her list, could this be a perfect storm of characters meeting next season? We will have to wait and see, obviously, but one weird thing is that Arya didn't actually mention these same names on a recent reciting of her list. Cersei Lannister. <coughs> Gregor Clegane. Walter Frey. So she might be up in the air about whether or not she still wants these people dead. And now we're off to Dorne for the first time since the season premiere. We won't stay long though because uh, I only want to point out a few quick things. First, when Lady Olenna explains that she's got nothing left. Sassy stole the future from me. With the fall of her house, it actually concludes something that she set up in the gift. I promise you, Lord Baelish, that our fates are joined. Together we murdered a king. If my house should fall, I will have nothing to hide. And if she lives up to her promise, it could throw a wrench into Littlefinger's plans. So, she's got nothing to lose. Is she gonna go out and tell everyone that Littlefinger helped kill Joffrey? I mean, she doesn't care about herself. She's got nothing to lose now. And that certainly would blindside him, especially since he was hoping to work with Cersei, who's just promised him Warden of the North. Name me Warden of the North. If he took out Ramsay Bolton, which he just did. Next, did you notice the way that Ilaria calls out Varys? Ringing a little bell? What the hell is that? That seems so rude. I think the reason we see Lady Elena smirk is because that's her move. She calls people out with little bells, but she has a really good reason. She's super old and has bad hips. Ilaria is maybe doing it as like a power move or something, but to Lady Elena, it just makes her look weak, like older than her years. But anyway, the real meat of this is when Varys comes out and reveals to Elena that she can deliver her vengeance in the form of... Fire and blood. I'm sure a lot of you caught that since you're all huge fans, but uh, in case you didn't, those are the words of House Targaryen. And speaking of House Bloody Fire, let's jump to Meereen. So we've got this really awkward breakup scene between Danny and Dario, and it's interesting that the emotions of the scene are actually totally undercut a moment later when Danny reveals that she didn't feel anything while she was talking to him. And I felt nothing. When Danny is scared of what that means, it's because she's wondering, is she unable to love anyone as much as she loves the idea of taking the Iron Throne? And that fear, her being afraid of who she might be, that's exactly who Cersei Lannister currently is. She barely feels anything when her son has died because it's given her the throne. And later, when it seems like the throne might have cost her her big love with Jaime, she doesn't really seem to care there either. Also quickly point out that this Dario frustration isn't as out of nowhere as it sounds. Are you a queen or fish bait? I can't bring a lover to Westeros. A king wouldn't think twice about it. So that's what you want? To be my mistress? He maybe sounds a little whiny right now about her not willing to keep him around when she gets married, but he's actually confused because she basically promised him that she'd be fine with keeping him around back in the gift. How long before the king comes to claim my pillow? Don't be ridiculous. My marriage is political. So you kind of got a feel for the guy, though what's funny is Danny's scene with Tyrion is actually much more emotional and sweet. I'll quickly note that Danny wears black here, just like Cersei, Olena, and a number of other characters this episode, and black does tend to signify death, but also power. So it fits each character pretty appropriately. But this moment when she makes Tyrion her hand, it's extra special for him because if you remember, back in the Battle of the Blackwater, Tyrion faced the same exact thing. A naval fleet trying to attack the city and his clever thinking got them out of it. That time though, Joffrey and Tywin get all the credit and then Tyrion is actually stripped of his title of Hand of the King. You are no longer Hand of the King. For your trouble. 
This time, he's appropriately rewarded and he's promoted to that same title. Also, the gift that Danny is giving him, the handpin, it's actually a nice completion to the gift that Danny gets back in that other episode, The Gift. It's Tyrion Lannister. I am the gift. So they really have developed a special relationship here, and it's kind of fun to note, her dad, the Mad King, he was Aerys Targaryen, and his hand was Tywin Lannister. Now we have Daenerys Targaryen, and her hand, Tyrion Lannister. It seems like another one of these cosmically linked relationships in this series. Let's keep going. Okay, and now we're back at Winterfell, and it's interesting that Sansa stands in the Godswood, and regarding the worship that's done there, she says, I'm done with all that. All that is the same religion that Bran is pretty solid evidence of being very legit. Little does she know, actually, that he can talk to the past through those same trees. Show some respect, Sansa. <laughs> But anyway, this scene actually has a parallel to a really long time ago, the pilot episode. There, also, a Stark sits at a tree while someone else hopes that they aren't interfering in that Stark person's prayer to the old gods. And in that first episode, it's about Catelyn telling Ned that John Aaron is dead. A fever took him. And that's actually the event that sets off this entire TV show. Catelyn suggests that Ned doesn't need to go to King's Landing to take over the role of Hand of the King that Jon Arryn had. You can always say no, Ned. But Ned does anyway, and we know how that turns out. In this episode, though, things are actually flipped pretty consistently as the outside person is Littlefinger, and instead of suggesting that the Stark not take the power, he's pushing Sansa to seek the power along with him. A picture of me on the Iron Throne you by my side. And Sansa says no to the suggestion that she go after the power while Ned actually ended up going after it. Also, there's another link between these scenes because the death of Jon Arryn, it wasn't a fever. It actually was a plot of Littlefingers. You gave me those drops and told me to pour them into Jon's wine, my husband's wine. And you told me to write a letter to Kat, telling her it was a Lannister. So in this grand plan that he laid out a long time ago, the Stark's involvement, it did start at that tree, and he's telling the truth that all of his choices have directly brought him closer to being at Sansa's side. For now, it's here back at this symbolic tree, though I bet he probably didn't predict that it was gonna be Sansa that he was trying to convince to join him. I think he probably would've imagined it would've been Catelyn, who was his first true love. I've loved you since I was a boy. It seems to me that fate has given us this chance to- You've lost your mind, get out! It's also worth acknowledging Littlefinger's confession here. This is actually the first time he's flat out admitted he wants the Iron Throne for himself and Sansa at his side. It all might be a play. He assumes Sansa's gonna turn it down flat out, but he wants to plant that idea in her head because he knows it's gonna grow. She's gonna feel that it's her that deserves to be the queen. He wants her pride to consume her as she sees Jon get all the credit in a little bit. Who should the North rally behind? True-born daughter of Ned and Catelyn Stark, born here at Winterfell. Or a motherless bastard, born in the South. And being queen was Sansa's childhood dream. Except it was with Joffrey, of course, so it wasn't a great dream. But Sansa still maybe doesn't trust Littlefinger in this moment, but the idea that he's planted, it can still grow with time. All right, and now we're arriving at the climax of the episode. And first, this rule that Benjen teaches us about the wall and how the magic keeps him from ever crossing it again. The wall's not just ice and stone. Ancient spells were carved into his foundations. Strong magic to protect men from what lies beyond. That sounds a lot like the magic that was previously keeping the White Walkers away from the Great Weirwood Tree. Though now that Bran has the Mark of the Night King, that magic over there has fallen. So does that mean that if Bran crosses the wall now, will the magic fall there too? It would let the White Walkers finally walk into the Land of Man? It kinda does sound like that's gonna happen, right? So basically, does Bran need to cut his arm off? That's all I'm asking. And just before we jump into Bran's vision, I'm gonna point out that this Weirwood Tree that he's about to see through, it could maybe be the same exact one that that John once used to take his Night's Watch vows. They're in roughly the same exact place, they have a similar expression, and the shape of their main branches is the same. The only reason I even hesitate is that there are a few minor differences, but honestly, I feel like that's more an accident, like the showmakers just couldn't get it to be a perfect match, and I'm actually leaning toward this being the same exact trait. 
But okay, into the vision. And it's the conclusion of our Tower of Joy scenes, and there is so much to talk about here. It's very important to point this out right now. This reveal, it's technically the biggest reveal in the entire story of Game of Thrones. This is the one thing people have been waiting over 20 years to confirm, and it's the question that George R. R. Martin used to test the HBO showrunners to see if they were even true fans. We had a three hour talk at the very end of it, George said, okay, okay, who is Jon Snow's real mother? <laughs> And there was a very long pause and I looked at Dan and Dan looked at me and we threw out a guess and uh, he kind of, he didn't say yes or no, but he sort of nodded and, uh, <laughs> and then he let us take the show. My point is this true parentage of Jon Snow is huge. And I have to point out in case it's still not clear, his mother is now officially Lyanna Stark, Ned Stark's sister. Something that we did not know until this moment. And his father is definitely Rhaegar Targaryen, Danny's older brother and son of the Mad King. And I know that, yes, they didn't technically underline that Rhaegar was his father, but everything in the history of this story has made it clear that Lyanna was impregnated by Rhaegar, who has had her hidden in this tower. And maybe the showrunners just wanted to save talking about the Targaryen side of him for next season. But that is definitely his father. HBO even put out a graphic after the episode to help clear it up. And while I understand that there are those of you who are still a little confused by it that is it's okay it's a little hard to keep track of all these things but the reason i'm emphasizing this so much is there are people out there a lot of them who still think that ned stark is john's dad to think that you would have to forget like again and again all the explanations of how ned has been searching for his sister to save her from rhaegar and i i don't know like i guess i can't be too shocked because jamie and cersei probably confused the hell out of a lot of people but ned is not his father rhaegar is but okay let's get into into specifics and the first thing I want to point out in the scene actually is when Ned turns around this time Bran hadn't shouted anything Father! That actually confirms for us that when Bran interferes in the past, he changes time forever. Since he didn't shout out and Ned still turned around, it wasn't him, it was a different past version of Bran that made him turn around. So it seems like anything that Bran does in the past can never be erased. Then when we're inside the room, I'm sure more than a few of you noticed that the show really focused on the sword being leaned against the bed. Well, that sword is Arthur Dane's, and if you remember from when we talked about that sword, its name is Dawn, and supposedly it was for from the remains of a fallen star. That's significant because in the Azor Ahai prophecy about the prince I was promised, it says he was born underneath a bleeding star. So if the sword is a star and it's covered in blood, then does that count for the prophecy? Maybe. Though it does seem like John was born a few minutes before the sword got placed there, but... Still, it feels like this could count. Okay, then let's acknowledge that this is a huge secret that's about to be created in this room and Ned and Lyanna aren't the only people there. Well, that could explain another secret of Ned's past. Do you remember way back in season one, Ned is being asked by Robert about this lady that he slept with who supposedly is John's mother. She must have been a rare wench to make Lord Eddard Stark forget his honor. Well, Ned gives Robert a very specific name and it's not Lyanna's, obviously. Wyla. Wyla. Well, in the books, Arya comes to know House Dane fairly well, and that's the same house of the knight that was guarding the tower outside, Arthur Dane. And Arya learns that House Dane had a servant named Wyla. And, except she wasn't just some servant. She was specifically a wet nurse for the Dane babies. So it would make a lot of sense if Ned has to make up some lie about some woman he supposedly fathered his baby with. He would just pick the name of one of the women that was already there. Wyla, servant of House Dane, who was brought there by Arthur Dane to care for this woman and her baby. And if you think about it, that lady does have to go on and back up Ned's lie anyway, so I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they came up with this bit of the story together. Maybe as she was helping to tend to the wounds of Mira and Jojen's dad, Howlin Reed, who as far as we know is still just waiting right outside. Now onto Liana and Ned's conversation. It was pretty hard to hear a lot of it, uh, but one of the things that Liana definitely says is, If Robert finds out that you kill him, you know he did. This concern about Robert killing a Targaryen baby explains why Ned was so upset about Robert's plot to kill Danny. Knowing that Robert still cares that much about wiping out the Targaryen line all these years later means that Jon is still in danger. I'll kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. I want him dead. Mother and child, both. Then we're no better than the Mad King. She dies. 
I will have no part in it. Also, I know some of you thought Lyanna meant Robert would kill Rhaegar, but at this point, Robert already had killed Rhaegar at the Battle of the Trident, and I think she would know that. But anyway, Lyanna says something else, and it's much harder to hear, actually, but it's also way juicier. Referring to the baby, she says, and then we don't hear the name at all. The one thing we can be pretty sure that she doesn't say is John. So does this mean that Jon Snow has a secret Targaryen name that we don't know about? Yes, it totally means that. And that would make sense because Targaryens have a very unique naming scheme. And if Ned kept his Targaryen name, everybody would know the secret that he's a Targaryen. As for what this secret name could be, well, I see two interesting options. So let's trigger regular theory time to discuss uh, what these names could be. Okay, so when I watched it, it looked to me like she was saying a name that started with an A sound, which is pretty common in Targaryen names. Aerys, Aemon, Aegon. And they often actually repeat names. So maybe from those exact names I just said, my pick would be Aegon. In the House of the Undying, Danny has all these visions, right? But in the books, it includes a vision of her brother Rhaegar saying that his son is probably the prince that was promised and should be named Aegon. Now the complication to this idea is that Aegon is the name of the baby that Rhaegar already had with his wife, Elia Martell, who the mountain murdered, you might remember. Uh, in the books, that baby was actually supposedly murdered by the mountain and there's a, just a lot more to his story but it really seems like they're not gonna do any of that story in the tv show so if that's the case then i could totally see them kind of merging it all and borrowing that aegon name for john also if his name really is aegon then we get another nice payoff to a scene from the gift in that episode maester aemon is dying and if you remember aemon is a targaryen himself and on his deathbed he encounters another baby and that baby reminds aemon of egg. egg, which is a nickname for Aegon Targaryen. Now that Aegon that he's talking about is actually Aemon's little brother, Aegon V, and grandfather of the Mad King, and a king himself in his own right. And Maester Aemon keeps lamenting that he wasn't there for little baby Aegon, and he's upset that he didn't help raise his own Targaryen blood. But Aemon did play a huge role in helping raise Jon Snow. Kill the boy, and let the man be born. He's instrumental in his formation as a leader. So if Jon Snow's name really is Aegon, then it could be a nice poetic link to Aemon sadly repeating Aeg. Again and again, these were some of his last words, and Aemon would now be properly honored because maybe he did miss out on helping raise his little brother Aegon V, but he was really there for his great-grandnephew Aegon VI. A Targaryen alone in the world is a terrible thing. Okay, so that's some supporting reasons why his name could be Aegon. But let's take a look at another option. And this one is one a lip reader actually claims that they think they saw Lyanna say. Uh, that name is Jaehaerys. That's a very old Targaryen name, but it actually has some positive traits associated with it, which is really rare for Targaryen names, by the way. Uh, this king was known for being wise. He ruled for a long time, and he expanded the lands of the Night's Watch into what is known as the New Gift. Jaehaerys II was the Mad King's father too, but the best argument for why this name could be Jaehaerys was Jaehaerys Targaryen was the Targaryen who received the prophecy about the prince that was promised being born from their line. It actually caused him to get really into incest within Targaryens actually. But uh, anyway, changing the name from Jaehaerys to John would respect that J sound beginning. And it also would let Ned simply just say, you know, yeah, I named him after John Aaron, the guy who basically raised Ned. So Jaehaerys is definitely an option too. So let's go ahead and jump out of theory time and wrap things up. Before we fully move on though, I just want to point out a few last interesting things here. First, we now know that John's grandfather killed John's other grandfather. The Mad King is his paternal grandfather who burned alive Lyanna and Ned's father, Rickard Stark. Next, don't you think that grown-up Lyanna Stark looks a lot like the Red Priestess Kinvara? Like, I can't say that they definitely did this on purpose, but considering that we know that Red Priestesses have the power to change their appearance, then Kinvara could be choosing to look like Jon's mom and Daenerys' Aunt Lyanna. Maybe. Okay, and finally, remember when we talked about the technical claim to the Iron Throne earlier? After Tommen and you climb upwards to the Baratheon line? Well, when we left off, we were saying Robert Baratheon's brothers are all dead and his parents are dead, but his grandparents, Targaryen, Rael, I think is her name, uh, her dad actually was Aegon V, who we mentioned earlier. So that's right. 
Robert is part Targaryen too, or he was. So if you follow that Targaryen line back down, the rightful heir using the firstborn son rules would be Jon Snow. But if Lyanna and Rhaegar were not married, which yes, I get that Rhaegar was already married to Elia Martell, but Targaryens did allow for polygamy. But yeah, let's say they were not married, then Jon would still be a bastard, which means good old Daenerys Targaryen would have the claim. Now, funny enough though, if you go even further up Robert's lineage, you actually get to a Lannister in there. So yeah, Robert was part Targaryen and vaguely related to the Lannisters the whole time. Uh, and if you follow that chain back down, you would get to either Jaime, who now that he isn't in the King's Guard might have claim, or Cersei. But the greater point to make here about claims in general is clearly all these people have as much legitimacy as any of the others do. So since there isn't a clear heir, this is why wars happen at least in that universe, the true person who's finally gonna sit the throne, it'll be the one with the support of an army and the people. Speaking of that, let's move on to the big declaration in Winterfell when Jon becomes And look at Jon's arc this season. He went from being not just betrayed by his men, but killed, like dead. And now he's climbed all the way to King of the North with a bunch of people supporting him. This meteoric rise of his is actually foreshadowed in the gift by a pretty surprising character. Bastards can rise high in the world, like your half-brother, Jon Snow. And this King of the North moment is definitely a storyline that is now further ahead than the books are, but there's a fun foreshadowing in the books where Lord Commander Mormont, he has this raven that speaks kind of like a parrot does, and he always seems to say things that have like a little bit of extra meaning. Like he actually says the word burn when Jon is fighting that white and gives him the idea to burn him. And another time, the raven keeps staring at Jon and flat out keeps repeating the word king. And it's barely a few lines later, like on that same page, that Jon learns that Rob has just been crowned king of the north. So that little section there definitely feels like a big foreshadowing of this moment. Okay, and since we are wrapping up this episode, I'm gonna start flying through some of these missable details. Uh, first off, it may not have been clear, but the man who does not want to serve alongside the wildlings... Knights of the Vale to side with wildling invaders. That's Lord Royce. He's the same guy who was giving Littlefinger all that trouble a couple of episodes ago, but he's also now chanting King of the North a few minutes later, like the rest of everyone is. And he's the head of the Knights of the Vale. So once more, he's just being a big old thorn in Littlefinger's side. Also, it's fun to realize after various men kneel to John, and while that chanting is going on, Tormund just keeps eating. Like, it's not a sign of disrespect, actually. It's a callback to the fact that the Wildlings, they don't kneel to any man south of the wall. Oh, and earlier when Lyanna Stark tells Ned who her baby is, it means she's revealing to him that this baby is in line to be the rightful king of Westeros. And that's mirrored nicely here when her namesake, Lyanna Mormont, declares that Jon is the rightful king here too. That said, those same points I just made kind of make this moment ironic as one of the main reasons these people are behind Jon is because he has Ned Stark's blood runs through his veins. Well, technically we just found out no he doesn't. Though he does have a Stark's blood in him. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering if Jon Snow is Jon Stark now, actually he's not. By becoming king, it actually doesn't matter that he's a bastard. He skipped the step of being legitimized because the powers of the North, the heads of the households, they all declared him a king. So he's an actual bastard king now. Of course, that's not what they call him. They call him the White Wolf. That's a bit of a callback to how Rob Stark was known as the Young Wolf. And it also sounds like it could be a reference to his white direwolf ghost but it's most likely Manderly referencing John's new house sigil that we'll see maybe eventually, which I also explained last episode. It would be a white wolf on a gray background. Also, for those of you that are looking for an explanation of this back and forth look from Sansa and Littlefinger, it's tough to know for sure. And while I think that it's purposely being left kind of open, the actress that plays Sansa said that when she was playing that, she was feeling jealousy in that moment. He's named King in the North and she kind of gets no credit for it. John, he's so naive. So Sansa is just a little bit agitated as all. <laughs> and that would imply that Sansa is actually realizing that Littlefinger may have been right and maybe she thinks she deserves that seat instead of Jon. But I like to think it's more complicated than that and she's also worried about what Littlefinger might be planning to do. That's kind of what I see in that look. Either way, I'm not too worried for Jon, uh, because like Danny, he's won his crown through loyalty and in an honorable way. And so that makes this coronation scene very interesting to put back to back with another coronation scene 
for the Queen of the South, who has almost the opposite circumstances. You can see that people hate Cersei. She does not have their support. And I do think we're supposed to be comparing these two situations right now because not only are the scenes placed back to back, but they're also shot very similarly. The wide shots of fire lead to the crowned person and the person whose further loyalty has become questionable moving forward, they're standing off to the side. Also fun to note is that this new queen, she's supposed to be heralded in by the ringing of the bell from the opening images, except she broke that bell. And I gotta say, I don't think that's a good sign for Cersei. And I'm not just saying that because of the looks of the people, it's look at Jaime. I don't think she's gonna sit on that Iron Throne very long. Jaime killed the Mad King for trying to do the thing that Cersei actually did. Is he gonna let her get away with that? Not to mention, she was indirectly responsible for the death of his last child. And he did just come from an encounter with his noble temptress, Brienne. I think there's definitely some real trouble brewing here between them. Oh, and I'll also call out, they brought back in that amazing score from earlier, but now they mixed in the Lannister Triumph song, The Reigns of Castamere. But again, House Lannister is not looking too good right now. Though, you know what, let's acknowledge, at least for this moment, at the end of season six here, Cersei has won. She actually had a very similar arc to Jon this season. We left her at her lowest low, leading out of season five and into this one, and now she's climbed all the way up and she's wearing a brand new crown. It's a pretty legit rise, definitely. And if you remember, Yara and Danny talked about how rare it was for a queen to rule in Westeros. Has the Iron Islands ever had a queen before? No more than Westeros. Now Cersei's beaten both of them to it. And what's interesting is that she did it in the way Danny had planned to. I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. But Danny, now with the guidance of Tyrion, is choosing to play the game. You're in the great game now. They've traded places in their approach. But unfortunately for Cersei, I do not think her approach is going to work when Danny gets there. In the famous prophecy that's now almost complete with all her children dead, there's also a part about Cersei taking the crown and then a younger, more beautiful queen taking it away from her. Now we all thought that was Marjorie, and I bet Cersei still thinks it's Marjorie, but it definitely seems like it's probably Daenerys actually. And Cersei's probably not gonna see any of this coming. And since we're here, let's go ahead and talk about these closing shots. Theon gets a visual representation of the season-changing theme when the winds indicate a new direction, out with the old and in with the new. And by the way, I'll point out here that this season-changing, it also happens to be happening when the end of a television season is changing as well, so that's fun. And since we did it for Jon and Cersei, we should also point out Danny's similar arc this season too. She started in a lowest low moment too, you know, down to nothing, and now she has behind her everything that she's always wanted, ships, dragons, a massive army of different forces, including support from major families of Westeros. You can see sigils for the Martells and for the Tyrells. So she's closer to her goals than she's ever been. And with this shot here of Danny finally heading to Westeros, her series long promise is finally being paid off. Funny thing to point out here about this scene, uh, when they were shooting it, it was very, very cold and no one could think clearly. So Amelia Clark, the actress that plays Daenerys, she told the director, Spochnik, hey, I can't think clearly. I have no idea what I'm supposed to have in my head while I'm staring off into the distance and thinking about the future. And he gave her just one tip, just one thing to do. And this is the take that they actually ended up using. He said, just hum the Game of Thrones theme to yourself. And that's what she did. That's what she's doing right there in this shot. I think it kind of works actually. And continuing with this out with the old and with the new theme, it's interesting to note how many of the important houses are now led by women. The Targaryens, the Lannisters, the Starks, the Martells, the Tyrells, the Greyjoys, the Mormonts, the Night Queen, Okay, I made that one up, but it's funny because you just probably couldn't have guessed this from the beginning when we were watching that first episode. There were so many powerful men around then, and even our show's main hero felt like this really good man. But looking at it now, who's gonna win this whole thing? It's kind of like George R. R. Martin is saying to us, Who said anything about him? And with so many of these promises finally being paid off, Jon confirmed as Rhaegar and Lyanna's son, Arya finally being a slick assassin who's taking vengeance for her family, Sansa is taking back Winterfell, Theon is back with the Greyjoys, Cersei's on the throne, Bran is the Raven, Jaime's an effective commander, and yeah, Danny with this fleet. We now have a setup 
for a brand new promise that there are going to be some amazing badass battles between a lot of people who have a lot of power. All right, so before we get to my lingering questions, I want to thank you all for watching this season of Breakdowns of Game of Thrones. Go back and watch any of the episodes you've missed. Uh, there's been a lot of fun stuff that we pointed out in them, some crazy predictions that somehow we got right, and some other stuff that we totally got wrong. But it's still probably fun to, to take in, and there's a lot of other good analysis in there, especially you have a lot of time to wait before next season. And I want to give a special shout out to our Patreon supporters who are really helping us put this content out. And they're also just helping us make other content in general about Game of Thrones and not Game of Thrones, Marvel and Star Wars and stuff. You can see a bunch of these people's names in the description below. Thank you so much to them. Uh, they're making all the difference. Specifically though, I got to give a shout out to my man, Kenny Smith, one of our very first supporters actually. Uh, I want you to know that New Rockstars knows no Kenny, but the Kenny from Patreon, whose name is Smith. And uh, I can't wait to talk creative stuff in our upcoming Google Hangout with Kenny and a bunch of other people. Uh, but all right, on to the questions. Okay, first, what do you think John's real name is? Aegon? Jaehaerys? Gary? What is it? Uh, let me know what you think. Second, is John going to find out about his true parentage soon? And if so, how? Howland Reed is still out there. Uh, is Bran gonna cross the wall maybe and tell him and bring a bunch of White Walkers with him too? Oh, you're secretly a Targaryen. Also, sorry I brought all these White Walkers with me. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Third, is Jaime gonna kill Cersei? If not, how else are they gonna wrap their storyline up? It does not feel like there's love there. That's my opinion. And actually, bonus question. Do you think Daenerys and company are gonna make this sea voyage unimpeded or are they gonna run into trouble? I think that they might actually, but I'm gonna save my idea for our season seven predictions video. Uh, keep an eye out for that one. It's coming fairly soon, as well as content about all kinds of other stuff. All right, follow at New Rockstars on Twitter if you wanna talk about when videos are coming out. They have the answer to that. Uh, and while I don't know when the video will be posted, I do know other stuff. So hit me up about Game of Thrones or other things you're curious about on my Twitter at Fimo or longer stuff on my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Fimonos. And in case you're still wondering, now you know two ways to support us in making more of this content. One, very directly, you can sign up to make ongoing contributions through Patreon, or if you don't wanna do that, that's fine. You can share our videos with your friends and help us expand our audience. Both of these are super helpful and very much appreciated. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Uh, keep an eye out for our other content. My name is Philip Molina, and I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye.